So, uh, I am going to talk about some of uh, the algorithmic development that we have been doing for uh, thinking about, you know, really large deep learning models. And uh, this is joint work with my PhD students, Ryan Beatty Tarun, and an undergrad, Frankie, is he in the audience? Yeah, so Frankie was an undergrad at Rice, now he's a master's student, and Icho, he was also Rice master's, now he's doing his PhD at MIT. All right, so I think this, uh, this plot is actually very clear and that uh, tells the trend that is what is going on. You need really large data and the more the data you have, the larger the neural network models that you need to get better performance. This has been very clear for, uh, you know, for, from the last three, four years. Uh, now, here, here are some of the trends. So, I mean, if you're following this uh, benchmark breaking things, then you will see that uh, the model that beats the previous benchmark is generally of the orders of magnitude more parameters. And ResNet is one of the example, which is considered a breakthrough in image recognition, and it was 10 times more parameters than the previously uh, used LANET model by Google. And uh, Google actually demonstrated the need for 137 billion parameter network, and they trained it, of course, using their TPUs. And a statement from that paper is, such model capacity is critical for absorbing the vast quantities of knowledge available in the training corpora. And the message is very clear that if we want, you know, if you want to have a model that, that predicts a lot of things, then I need, I need a, you know, a huge capacity. So uh, in the past decade, we used to have a data, we used to create a knowledge base, and then if suppose I want to do a task of question answering, then you show this question to the knowledge base and you get the answer. Now this has been pretty much changing, and, and the example is question answering machine translation, saying that if you have enough question and answer pair, and enough means really large amount of them, then you just take a very large neural network and show it enough question answer pair, and after and train it, throw it, uh, you know, at a whatever hardware you have, and you know, this, uh, this leads to much better result than this, uh, at least that is what we are seeing so far. But again, that there are a lot of possible answers. So if you think about just the output space that I'm looking at, it's really big. The number of neurons in the output is going to be huge, humongous. So again, like I'm just reiterating this point that the basic information theory says we need large models. So we are entering in a phase where we want all decisions to be made by a unified model, and you are looking at papers like one model beat all, bird from Google that just one model for all the tasks in natural language processing. And again, think about it. One model for all decisions, how many decisions do you want to make? And how many patterns do you want to absorb? Your information theory will say the model has to be big. And so there is no surprise that Google needs a 137 billion neural network model or Microsoft beats the previous image recognition with something like 60, uh, 10x more parameters than the previous ones. Here are some of the obvious numbers to look at. So let's take a neural network with 100 billion parameters. And believe me, it's really easy to justify a need for 100 billion parameters. Just look at a task and, for example, recommendation system. I want to, pre I want to predict, given an input, I want to predict what products to show. How many products are there? 50, 100 million? Any hidden layer, you are there. 100 billion is not a, not a big deal. Now, if you think about 100 billion, that's 400 gigabytes memory just to store the parameters. Forget about the data. And if you're thinking of training with algorithms, popular algorithms like Adam, you need two auxiliary parameters per parameters, that is the momentum and the velocity. So you're looking at actually 1.2 terabyte of memory just to, st just to train this model without even storing a data. Now, let's look at what we have. If we look at the best GPU that we have, look at NVIDIA V100 that has only 32 gigabytes of memory. So if I want to train such a model, I'll require at least around 40 GPUs, and then good luck with your communication and uh, you know, stuff that goes on with it. Now if you're looking at CPUs, CPUs are good because they have like, you can have a big RAM CPU. For example, I have a machine with 1.5 terabyte of RAM. But then, you know, good luck with training time, not enough parallelism, and, you know, like if you have to distribute, then again, issues of communication. And again, we all have been seeing this in, uh, you know, like the, the Moore's law has ended, so, I mean, uh, the way the community is looking at is that we need to look towards specialized hardwares. But there's one assumption that we are making. We are assuming that we don't have better alternatives than the horribly inefficient backpropagation. 
and we we all know that this is 30 years old algorithm and we are still using it and remember that when back propagation was designed computation and data were never a concern 30 years ago of course that was not a concern and one of the justification for you know still using the same algorithm is of course we have not seen a better alternative so far which you know which is reliable and again there was a talk around 2 pm that if we have to go beyond moore's law we have to use all the tricks and the question that i'm going to ask in this talk is why not use algorithmic tricks and so i'll show you that uh, hopefully i'll convince you that there are some of the very smart algorithms that can actually go very very far if you combine it with simple parallelism and uh, it will become more clear what I mean by those algorithms and what I mean by simple parallels. So here is what I want to think is when we are thinking about something that I want to get off by, so I want to improve something by a factor 1.5 to 5x, then what I think a reactive approach works is we start with something that we know works and then we squeeze everything out of it to get it in that domain, that might work. But if I want to go off by 10x factor, then we have to think in a different domain, in a different plane. We have to think philosophically different. If we have an algorithm which is philosophically similar to what we already know, it is unlikely to give us something like 10x factor. And this is one of the famous quotes is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use them when we created them. It's by Albert Einstein. All right, so I look at this one particular problem. So this is an open directive project data set. It was released by Microsoft and basically it is just a multi-class classification where you are given a Wikipedia document and you have to predict which category this document belongs to. The number of categories are 100,000, not very big. And the number of features are 400,000 per example. Now if you think about a single logistic regression, that's roughly 160 gigabytes of memory. I'm not talking about any complex model, simple logistic regression, just multiply, that's the amount of weight. You need one weight vector for each class, that's 160 gigabyte of memory. Now, if you look at what are the state of the art on this, uh, this data set, what uh, the best algorithm we have requires 100 node cluster with more than 24 hours of training, achieves 9% accuracy. By the way, 9% is a good accuracy because this is a balanced data set. So a random accuracy is one over 100,000. Now, what I'll show you is that if we think, you know, if you are thinking diff there are different algorithms that can actually give you much better accuracy and much better scalability and memory footprints. And in fact, this is a generic technique in which we can distribute, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the computation across multiple compute nodes or machines or even heterogeneous hardware. Okay, so first of all, I mean, the, the issue here is that we have too many classes. So if I'm storing even like, so what, I, what I'm looking at is, I have to identify into K classes and this K is really large. So imagine you want to predict all possible products in a recommendation system. You're running a search engine and you want to predict all possible outcomes. That's a really large space. So if I just even keep one unique parameter for each class, that is too much. Now in high performance computing, everything is memory bound. So if I reduce the memory footprint, hopefully I can get better algorithms and even you know better scalability. By the way, if you're thinking in terms of trees, they don't help, they are worse in memory because they require k log k memory. There are leaves, leaves has to be k, and so there are more. And here, here are you know, like a usual distributed scenario, you have different machine, you want to minimize communication, uh, you know, you want to also reduce synchronization, and also it could be like, you know, machines have different uh, compute capability, and you know, it could also be heterogeneous. So here is a wish list. Can we distribute parameters such that there is no communication synchronization? So I'm looking at the ideal wish list and I'm trying to reduce the communication for the number of classes. And also, can we compress the model size? And the reason I'm talking here is because I have a way to do this, at least in this case. And here is how, what works. And the idea is a simple randomized divide and conquer. So think about the task. We want to just classify, given an input, a particular class. Here is what I'll do. I'll take the trading data and I'll randomly merge the classes into small number of buckets. So I'll take, let's say, a 1 million classes and merge 1 million into, let's say, 1,000 buckets. So I'm randomly merging lots of classes. And I'll repeat this merging process independently few number of times. And my claim is that this is more or less going to solve the problem and we'll see how this. 
So here is a picture. So imagine this, these are the number of classes and here is a very big classifier that predicts a probability of each of these classes. Now instead of having a big classifier which predicts the probability of each of these classes, let me take a random hash function and map all these into few b number of buckets. Now every bucket is going to be a combination of let's say a randomly chosen classes. So it can be like an orange, mango, cars, buses all merged in. And I have a classifier that actually predict these meta classes. So my classifier tells me, oh, bucket 15 has higher probability here, bucket 2 has higher probability here, bucket 1 has higher probability here and so on and so forth. The claim is that if I look at high probability buckets here, I can figure out what is the high probability class here. And the thing is, I am only using the same classifier except this time the number of classes are much small. So if there is a way from here to come back here, then there is a way to reduce the number of memory to much something much less and observe that these classifiers don't have to talk with each other. Now this is where coding random decoding theory, if you are thinking in coding and decoding theory, that is precisely the answer. Basically a vanilla classifier will predict something like this. It will predict, a, give a probability to every class and a correct class will get a very high probability. Now what I am arguing is that, is the, just the basic theory of random coding is that we can identify large magnitude probabilities if we know logarithmic many sparse random sums. We never materialize all these PIs. And here, I mean, an, an, an answer is this. So let's look at these two. Let's say a classifier tells me bucket 15 is a high class bucket, and here bucket 16 is a high class bucket. So if there is an intersection of bucket 15 and 16, most likely those are the high class classes, assuming the classifier is doing something. And that is precisely uh, the theory of, uh, you know, like you can call it compressed sensing, count min sketch. They are all the same. So instead of predicting the k class probabilities, I am taking a random summation and predicting the summation. Note that the classifier, the probabilities are additive. So if I merge class 1, 5, and 7, the classifier is likely to predict me p1 plus p5, p5 plus p7. Whereas I cannot do p1 minus p5 plus p7, I cannot do it with the classifier. Now if you want to look at the pseudocode, the pseudocode is as, the, as simple as this. I'm given the xi and yi, that's my training data. What I do is I take yi and use a hash function to map it to some small number of classes. So from one to r, I just hash it to zero to b and just train your favorite classifier over xi comma the hash of yi and then you're done. And you can do this as parallel and independent classifiers. They don't have to talk with each other. And if you have a heterogeneous hardware, then you can actually you know that you know some of your hardwares are slower than other, then you merge it into even smaller classes for the hardwares which are like which are weak for the you know for the hardware which is does not have enough cap capacity. And the pseudocode for testing is that for, uh, you just accumulate the probabilities of all those meta buckets and you can actually identify the top k one using you know you any your any of your favorite compressed sensing methods. Now, if you look at the performance, here are the three, the data set that I just told you, ODP data set, here are the three best published result on this data set. On the X axis, you see the number of, uh, number of buckets I am merging into and the Y and these different ones are the number of repetitions. Now, if you look at the time, you, we only need 7.2 hours as I am taking, I'm using 25 different classifiers. If you do it sequentially on a GPU, if you give me 25 GPUs, then I can do it in uh, around 15 minutes, actually, uh, 17 minutes. And it is model parallelism. It's not an ensemble. It's not like I'm training different classifier and averaging. Each of the classifier is part of the bigger classifier is just in a compressed sensing view. It's a dual view of uh, how, what things are going on. And one of the weird things are, why am I even able to surpass the accuracy of other model? Because think about the model size. The initial model size is 160 gigabyte. I can get the same thing in 1.2 gigabyte. It is an implicit regularization. Some weird thing in machine learning that approximations are sometimes beneficial. 
So essentially we want to, you know, if you rethink about algorithms, we can get way beyond. Now here is something that, uh, you know, I've, I've, we have recently worked on and, uh, you know, we'll release this on archive very, uh, very soon. Uh, here is what we were obsessed with, that can we have a good algorithm that, that can beat V100 with a simple CPU. So you give me a neural network that can fit in on your V100 and train it on your TensorFlow. I have a simple CPU, can I beat that algorithm? Can I beat that, that setting, of course, with a different algorithm? And the answer is yes. And uh, I won't go into much detail, but the, the crux of the algorithm is this, I'm going to exploit sparsity. So when I'm doing an SGD training, given an input, I'll hash the input and go to a hash table, probe a memory location, and that memory location will tell me which nodes are going to be active. Then I'll take this uh, sparse pattern, hash, go to a hash table and probe a memory location, know which neuron will be active, and I'll get a snap, sparse snapshot of a network by a few memory lookups. And there is two or three years of work behind this as to why we can do this for inner products. And this, these, these are guaranteed to give me high, um, you know, high activation neurons by simple, you know, memory probes. And what I'll do is I'll only do feed forward and back propagation on this sparse network. So that's the algorithm part. The good thing is that the computations are small. And uh, because these are sparse, very sparse, I can do two updates or multiple updates in parallel because they are unlikely to overlap. So the parallelism that I'm using is I'm parallelizing SGD across data because it's sparse update. And the algorithm I'm using allows me to get the sparsity pattern of the neural network by, by just few memory lookups. And here, is the comp uh, here are the competitors. So I'll just take TensorFlow on this CPU that I had, which has 40, 48 cores. It's an Intel 8175 CPU. Uh, then the TensorFlow on Tesla V100, the 32 gigabyte uh, GPU. And this algorithm, which I called Slide, it's sublinear deep learning engine. Sublinear because it samples neurons and it's sublinear in the number of neurons. And what we are going to look at is the accuracy climb with training time, the wall clock training time. And this is the data set. So this data set is, uh, you know, Amazon product data set. Again, 670, uh, 670 possible outputs and 135,000 input dimension, half a million training sample, 100K testing sample. The architecture is a fully connected ne uh, neural network with 173 million parameters. This all fits in V100 GPU comfortably. Batch size is 256 and here are the results. So this black line is TensorFlow on the CPU. This is time in the logarithmic scale. This is accuracy climb. And the same thing with iteration and accuracy climb. So this shows you that the optimization does not change anything. So the optimization wise, it's the same. Because the epoch wise, the optimization algorithm is the same. Now if you look at the black line, that's the running time. So see it's slow with CPU and TensorFlow. When I put TensorFlow on GPU V100, it's much faster and it gives me this blue line, which is expected. We know that V100 is much faster than CPU. But if I use the smart algorithm on the same CPU, then the red line is basically the smart algorithm on the same CPU. And you can see that it even outperforms V100. And the reason it's outperforming is because it's doing a very smart computation rather than the dumb back propagation. And uh, okay, in the last minute, I just want to show you the scalability with the number of cores. So you only need roughly around eight cores to beat the GPU. So this is basically the GPU. This is the number of cores in the log scale, and this is the convergence time, the time required to converge. It goes down roughly straight, and this is uh, this is TensorFlow CPU. All right. Uh, well, I'll I'll stop with that. Uh, you know, the moral of the story is that we should use our parallelism wisely and we are, when we are exploiting trick, let's start with the algorithm once because it can go a long way. Adoption is easy and cheap. Here are the references. Thank you.